thank you for having me. It's it's really good to be here, and and it's it's um, you know, as I was telling Colin and and Mr. I think um, I'm neither a law person nor am I a tech person. So I'm I'm trained as a rhetorician, um, and which means that I'm interested in I guess the ways in which some of these issues intersect around language and how the language that we use um, and the arguments that we develop and the metaphors that we use to develop those arguments, how they really can affect um, and, and limit and open up possibilities um, for social movements and so on. Um, so I'm going to be talking um, specifically about um, the book Our Space, but primarily about um, the last case study uh, that, I, that I engage in the book, and that is about Creative Commons, which, as you know, um, was founded here, and and I'm sure some of you are still um, involved. And so, again, um, as far as issues of intellectual property and and um, and so on, I know that I'm in a room full of people that probably know more about these issues than I do. So, um, so I'll look forward to your thoughts and comments, um, and hope that the added value that I bring to the table is is some thoughts about um, the language that we use and so on. So, the central task of the book is um, just to give you a little bit of background on that to kind of tee up um, what I want to talk about, which is the, the last argument in the book. Um, but the central task of the book is to investigate the constitution and inventional possibilities of publics in an age dominated by the rhetoric and logics of the market. That is, how are publics made and what can they do? In the book, I examine how social movements like culture jamming seek to undermine the rhetoric of multinational corporations, specifically through practices such as media pranking, and the, some of the examples that I look at in the book is the work of a group out of San Francisco called the Biotic Baking Brigade. Um, if you're not familiar with them, their mission to pie pompous people. Um, in here is they've pied Bill Gates. Here they pied Milton Friedman. Um, and I talk about, at some length, media pranking as a strategy in other chapters um, of the book. And sort of good old-fashioned ad busting, which you're probably familiar with, the work of Adbusters magazine. This is um, kind of a play on this um, campaign that The Gap ran in the late 90s, which was, you know, different um, countercultural figures wearing khakis to kind of position um, khakis as, you know, sort of the rugged individualist pant choice. <laughs> um, and of course, um, yeah. So they, this obviously turns it into sort of mass conformity writ large. Um, so ad busting, things like billboard liberation, right? People like the billboard um, liberation front who go out in the middle of the night and do some things as sophisticated as actually rerouting neon and turning off parts of signs and so on. Sometimes it's just sophisticated computer graphics that alter existing um, advertising messages and so on. Um, or copyright and trademark infringement, and you're probably familiar with a lot of that work. Um, people that are just um, trying to steal, hijack, you know, corporate imagery in order to um, either comment on the kind of litigiousness of um, corporate culture around their brands and their brand imagery, um, or just to make a case for, um, for public domain in general. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, some of that. Um, but among the questions that the project raises is whether so-called resistance, as traditionally conceived, has reached its limit as a diagnostic category for critics interrogating struggles over cultural messages in the global economy. So in the book, I provide a taxonomy of contemporary anti-corporate activism that I break down in the following way. And first are, um, are activists engaging in what I talk about as sabotage. Um, and that's an explicitly dialectic <clears throat> repudiation of the rhetoric of consumer culture. It's a strategy that begins from the premise that we have become merely consuming publics, which is the original title of the book, by the way. Um, that we've become merely consuming publics, publics who consume. Uh, sabotage is a direct attempt to thwart what activists see as the repressive disciplinarity of the spectacle and to wake the citizenry from their stupor. So it's a very kind of wake up, um, shake the masses and to sort of bring them to reality in some way. The rhetoric of sabotage is probably best exemplified by Adbusters magazine, and I look at them in, at some length in the book, um, and their approach to commercialization as a monolithic machine or image factory that must be stopped or slowed down. So this is culture jamming in a very oppositional way. Um, in fact, in their Culture Jammers manifesto that they publish in Adbusters and also in their founder, Callie Lassen, has a book called Culture Jam. 
their culture jammers manifesto says we're going to bring the imagery to a shuddering the image factory to a shuddering halt um, and I, I talk about that it's very telling that they use this very industrial revolution factory metaphor as a way of talking about the enemy. Um, and in fact, they talk about themselves as contemporary saboteurs, and they use the language of sabotage quite a bit. Um, sabotage, for those of you that may not know, etymologically comes from the word sabot, which means wooden clogs. Um, and during the Industrial Revolution, when workers wanted to s literally stop the machine of industry, they would show, throw their clogs, uh, where we also get the metaphor to clog, they would throw their clogs into the machinery, into the factory machine, in order to stop work for the day and so, uh, as a means of protest. Um, part of what I suggest in, in the book is that although sabotage has its time and place, and it certainly had its time and place in the face of industrial capitalism and sometimes today in certain parts of the world, in the fa I, I challenge the notion that we can really look at today's consumer culture and today's sort of sw swirling, scintillating barrage of images as a factory. I wonder about the limitations of that very 20th century or 19th century metaphor um, for how capitalism functions. Um, secondly, I examine culture jamming strategies that rather than sabotaging commercial culture attempt to appropriate it toward new ends. So through practices of pranking, like I showed you the, um, the um, pies in the face, and I look at a variety of sort of people who commit pranks in order to get themselves on um, television and so on, um, and also copyright pirates I put in this group. Um, these appropriation artists attempt to take seriously consumer culture on its own terms and engage it accordingly. So it's less oppositional um, and more sort of taking advantage of some of the resources that commercial culture pr provides. Um, however, I suggest that appropriation artists, in their celebration of the criminal artist, do tend to perpetuate, although less so maybe than saboteurs, a dialectical or oppositional relationship with commercial culture. By positioning themselves as outlaws, I argue that appropriation artists risk validating the very codes they challenge. This strategy begins from another premise, that the dictates of markets have so successfully turned us into mere consumers that the only response is the citizen as criminal. That is, post-industrial capitalism with its tendency to turn products into brands and brands into the vernacular of everyday life has consumed publics. So markets are consuming publics rather than just turning us into consumers. Publics in, in that sense are being consumed. So I conclude the book, and this is what I want to talk about um, today, I conclude the book by looking at a third set of responses to commercial culture, um, responses that do not so much attempt to thwart brand giants nor liberate small pieces of culture from their clutches. Rather, by actively promoting the concept of the commons, these activists augment and intensify certain aspects of markets. So importantly, the strategy is unavailable to those who see markets and publics as mutually exclusive. Rather than saying no to consumer culture as the antithesis of healthy, thriving publics, an intensifica intensification strategy says yes and to the tools that markets afford. This strategy begins from the premise that publics are everywhere, that they are all consuming. It is this third strategy that I want to discuss today, and it comes from the final chapter um, of the book, which is Inventing Publics, Kairos, and Intellectual Property Law. So just a bit about some and, and, um, contemporary theories on sort of the notion of how publics function. Um, one of the more popular in the recent studies of publics and publicness has been Michael Warner's Publics and Counterpublics. In Warner's model, Publics do not exist a priori their, text, their textual interpretation, I'm sorry, interpolation, before they are called into being by the rhetorics that speak them. As such, publics are kinds of fictions, albeit fictions with identifiable properties and very real material effects. Publics, as Warner begins his book, are queer creatures. You cannot point to them, count them, or look them in the eye. You also cannot easily avoid them. They have become an almost natural feature of the social landscape, like pavement. However, as even a cursory read of his argument illustrates, Warner's publics are really nothing like pavement. They are shaped by the temporality of circulation, those are his terms, um, an ebb and flow of discourses demanding our attention and building on one another. Their rhythms are shaped and punctuated by an endless systolic and diastolic pulsing of newspapers, Hollywood films, 24-hour news channels, sitcoms, movies of the week, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the texts of our everyday lives that constitute the teeming and multi-citational field in which publics are made. So for Warner, I think he really foregrounds this notion that um, publics are created through the circulation of texts. 
So, so questions of intellectual property law and how is it that texts circulate have a direct effect on what we can understand as, as public. <clears throat> What does invention, which is a primary concern for rhetoricians like myself, or creativity, um, maybe put more plainly, um, invention or foundation of rhetoric, what does it look like in such a model? How can publics thrive and create under these conditions? One response, a, a very common response, one that I'd like to resist, uh, would, would be to begin from the premise insisted upon by people like Jürgen Habermas that the public flourishes in the absence of control, that healthy publics enjoy absolute freedom from, say, governmental or commercial constraints. Warner's metaphors such as circulation and dissemination might indeed lend themselves to the position that the circulation of texts that constitute publics must be protected from rules or obstructions of any kind. So in my analysis, I look at, um, I'll, I'll kind of speed through some of this kind of public theory stuff. Um, um, one of the concerns is that that um, certainly that intellectual property law is acting as a tourniquet. It's choking off the circulation of texts on which publics de depend, right? That if, again, if publics completely depend on the, the free circulation of texts, then there's this concern that intellectual property law, copyright um, regimes, and so on are kind of acting as a, as a tourniquet. Um, so for many, at the heart of the debate is our freedom of speech and our capacity to create new and innovative works. And at stake for many of those evolved, of course, is the conditions for creativity itself. So some who might agree with the notion that publics depend upon the circulation of texts see the regime of intellectual property law, again, as, as increasingly threatening this dynamism on which publics thrive, acting as a tourniquet. So my goal is to contribute to the conversation about publics by suggesting that kairos, the Greek concept of kairos, which I'll talk about in a little bit, or a kind of making do, is an inescapable component of text making and indeed public making. This conception encourages, in the case of contemporary intellectual property law, responses that improve on, improve on what is rather than mourn a fantasy of what was. I argue that if we look at the strategies of some anti-copyright -cop activists, many of them are fighting for a deregulation of the discursive field, for a lightening of the burden of intellectual property. Their approach correlates to an understanding of publics that would assume that because circulation is what publics require, the appropriate uh, strategy of resistance ought to be to lift regulations that bind them, <coughs> to decentralize power and to return to the notion of ideas as common property. Toward this end, many anti-copyright activists act as modern-day Robin Hoods, by artistically pirating or hacking copyrighted and trademarked material in an effort to reinvigorate a sense of the commons. As I argue then, um, the copyright pirate model of resistance, <clears throat> despite its good intentions, perpetuates and solidifies the most harmful assumption girding current intellectual property law, that is that intellectual materials can and should be exclusively treated as property. As an alternative to the notion um, that ideas and, and concepts are property, I suggest that the most compelling approach comes from the so-called free culture or creative commons movement. Um, unlike other copyright activists, those who ostentatiously pirate corp corporate intellectual property in an effort to make a case for deregulation, the creative commons sharing model embraces a thoughtful and detailed increase in regulations, agreement that emer agreements that emerge in specific and ever-changing encounters between texts, the law, and publics. Ultimately, I argue, perhaps controversially, that a conception of rhetorical invention based on the classical I Greek ideal of kairos rather than property offers a way of reimagining the public as being made more robust, not less, by regulations, albeit regulations of a different kind. Kairos, in the sense that I want to propose it here, is a rhetorical art for which, Karen, Car in Carolyn Miller's words, quote, the challenge is to invent within a set of unfolding and unprecedented circumstances an action, rhetorical or otherwise, that will be understood as uniquely meaningful within those circumstances. And I'll talk about it um, a little bit more. Now, now, again, I don't want to rehearse issues that people are well familiar with, so I'll just um, um, maybe abbreviate here a little bit. But um, Part of what I suggest in the book, again, which is for a more general audience than what I have here, is um, talking about you know, the notion that um, ideas don't operate based on notions of scarcity um, and so on, um, which a lot of anti-copyright activists and others um, um, readily say, right? And they often quote Jefferson, his, his metaphor about sort of, if I light your candle with mine, it's, you know, um, um, mine isn't darkened and so on. People, people use those metaphors. But at the same time, 
there continues to be a lot of rhetoric, um, such as John Oswald's notion that if creativity is a fence, is, if creativity is a field, trademark is the fence, which is an oft quoted, as you probably know, um, comment um, about the the influence of intellectual property on creativity. Um, similarly. Um, yeah, you know, I'll talk about in, uh, talk about that in a minute, right? So, so there's this great resistance to this notion of, of um, you know, trademark as being the fence, presumably that cordons off um, creativity and so on. So, of course, in response, um, a number of scholars and activists and so on have advanced then this metaphor. Um, maybe it's maybe the metaphor isn't even the right way of putting it. Um, this notion of the commons, right? Kind of echoing Habermas's fears about the monopolizing tendencies of private enterprise. Um, communication scholar Kimberly McLeod, for example, um, wonders in his book Owning Culture, in this environment, how in the world are people supposed to critique the ubiquitous privately owned texts that help shape our consciousness without being able to reproduce them? So growing of, um, a growing number of so-called appropriation artists are responding by invoking a kind of pirate ethic, as I've mentioned before. Um, by unabashedly using copyrighted and trademark material in their own work, they attempt to call attention to the asymmetrical control over our cultural materials. In doing so, many activists have sometimes unwittingly provoked major, major corporations into high-profile legal battles, which directly affect the future shaped shape of what counts as the public domain. So illustrating this kind of art of theft, those who pirate and hijack own materials <clears throat> attempt to free information and so on um, from what they see as the prison of private ownership. And a couple examples of um, well-known cases, this is the Food Chain Barbie series by Forsyth, Tom Forsyth. And, um, this is probably a familiar case for some people. Um, the artist, um, the Starbucks took him to court, realized that they didn't have a case um, based on um, copyright because his, this was considered fair use, it's political commentary and so on, but they kind of did an end run and got him on trademark dilution, um, which is increasingly, as some of you probably know, um, used by corporations um, against political commentators when I think that it's meant to be a protection against um, other corporate um, marketers and so on, com competitors. So a concern for the um, commons is a concern that the texts that create publics are being strangled again by the control of copyright. So part of, you know, and, and again, this is kind of a couple chapters that I go over, um, sort of the notion of appropriation by both pranksters and, and pirates. Um, but part of the critique that I have as, as productive and sometimes appropriate these kinds of strategies are, again, um, as, as somebody who studies rhetoric, my position is always that, um, that you need to pick a strategy based on the situation in which you find yourself. So, um, so no strategy is universally good, no, no strategy is universally bad. But one of the limitations that um, I think that appropriation art has um, in the face of its um, perceived enemy is that <clears throat> I want to suggest that the restrictions posed by intellectual property are more prohibitive if we accept the notion that intellectual material can only be imagined as property. And I worry that the appropriation artist strategy of stealing copyright material, so-called stealing, um, as an act of subversion is too limited. That is, if we perpetuate romantic notions of an anti of anti-copyright activists as pirates or Robin Hood stealing from monolithic corporate landlords, we leave uninterrogated the founding premise that ideas are property that can be hoarded or denied. The most crucial argumentative terrain is seeded from the start. That is, I say in the book that, that it's like stealing bits and pieces from the kingdom while leaving the monarchy intact. So, yeah, so I'm going to sort of leave that because I think that hopefully um, that critique is clear. But, to, but together with, um, with the notion, Oswald's notion that trademark is the fence of in creativity in a field of creativity, um, likewise, David Bullier's position serves as another example of this kind of call for, again, the lifting of restrictions. He says, quote, any sort of creative endeavor, which is to say progress, requires an open white space in which experimentation and new construction can take place. There must be the freedom to try new things. 
So in his book, Silent Theft, he describes a monolithic corporate takeover of our commonly shared resources that diminishes the variability to progress as a culture. He idealizes an open, decentralized train for civic invention that is unsullied by the interests of private enterprise. As he says, quote, an argument for the commons, then, is an argument for more white space. So part of if I could just kind of, I guess, get to the, the nub of, of um, where I come down on this, um, a after, in, and I'm, I won't um, um, kind of rehearse as I, as I might talking to a different group, um, rehearse kind of how Creative Commons functions and, and, and what its role is and, and so on. Um, part of the argument that I make is that it's, this isn't um, a creating more white space. It's not about lifting the fence um, from a field of creativity. Um, it's, in fact, an intensification of certain um, aspects of copyright and so on, right? That it's a layered, added layer of augmentation or an added layer of nuance um, that in fact can increase the circulation of texts rather than decrease them, which is, which is often the fear. Um, and I go about this through, um, among other things, the concept of kairos. Um, and uh, let me talk just a little bit about that so that you know where I'm coming from. So if we allow a notion of publics that, that recognizes that circulation is not necessarily the dialectical opposite of regulation, again, so it's not just about lifting regulation. I think the Creative Commons case sort of shows that, um, that an added level of, of regulation can actually speed up and free up texts. Um, then we remain open to the ways in which the intensi intensification of regulatory categories um, can actually increase the circulation and vitality of creative publics. So in the book, I propose that for those interested in promoting a robust and democratic, no, um, democratic commons, the ancient rhetorical concept of kairos serves as a more appropriate rhetorical resource than property. In the golden age of Greece, Philip Saporia tells us, kairos was, quote, typically thought of as timing or the right time, although its use went far beyond temporal reference. So unlike chronos or chronos, which was associated with a linear qualitative time, quantitative time, excuse me, Kairos was better understood as a moment of a particular quality. The word um, carried a number of meanings, including symmetry, propriety, occasion, due measure, fitness, tact, decorum, convenience, proportion, profit, and wise moderation. So it's all about sort of, um, it's a, a meaning about taking advantage of the particular moment in which one finds themselves. And I go to some links in the book, to, to, in my analysis of Creative Commons, that, um, the, that the fact that you can tailor licenses um, and agreements um, based on each text and based on each instance um, allows for um, Kairos to thrive, or that it capitalizes on this sort of chirotic moment. So that it's not this blanket, zero-sum sort of code that gets a priori mapped onto every transaction. Instead, a kind of a, um, Creative Commons really makes use of that kind of um, in the moment, in every sort of specific situation, you to negotiate the, the rules of the road um, um, between creators and users and so on. <coughs> so, uh, so I just want to conclude my comments with this strange notion that rhetorical invention may work like a pinball machine. So I encourage us to collaborate on alternatives to models of res rhetorical resistance in which publics, um, let, me, let me reword this. Um, I encourage us to collaborate on alternatives to models of rhetorical resistance um, that, that move away from the notion in which publics are perpetually on the losing side of an endless cat and mouse game with the corporate establishment. That is, it's probably clear, hopefully, that I'm, um, that I'm not willing here to, um, to conclude that, yes, intellectual property always stifles creativity, right? That that's, that that's um, how it works, right? So certainly corporations invoke and even lobby for laws so that they can thwart certain kinds of critique. And it's true that copyright laws were never intended to be used ideologically to silence political dissent. However, as may always be the case, when some chirotic moments are undermined, others are foregrounded. That is that the current state of intellectual property law is the chirotic moment in which we find ourselves. It, it provides the conditions from which um, challenges can emerge. 
So I offer here the strange supposition that the field of rhetorical invention may be something akin to a pinball machine. I invoke that image because in response to Bollier's position that, the creative, that creative progress requires more open space, I want to suggest quite the opposite. Just as a pinball would gather no momentum, no speed, no direction without bumpers and pins to respond to, neither is rhetorical invention possible without constraints and obstacles that define its chirotic encounters. So with this perhaps juvenile example in mind, I would like to return to John Oswald's assertion that, create, that trademark is the fence in the field of creativity. Oswald's description is quite useful, although maybe not in the way that he intended. Language is funny that way. Intellectual property is not merely a fence that confines and makes discreet a piece of stagnant property, an impermeable boundary along which powerful corporations successfully post their no trespassing signs. Rather, it is a fence that gives shape and substance to specific fields of discourse. Importantly, fences can be straddled. They can be climbed under, over, and through. They can be extended and reconfigured into playful mazes. They can be walked on like a tightrope. And that ability to walk delicately and precisely in a state of in-between is precisely what defines kairos, perhaps the most crucial component of rhetorical invention. So the mythical figure of kairos was um, a minor god in the Greek pantheon, and he was depicted as a well-muscled, wing-footed figure perched on a stick or ball, balancing a set of razor, uh, a set of scales on a razor, um, almost as if walking along a fence. He is also often depict, be, t depicted with winged feet, presumably for those moments when, like a pinball hitting a bumper, he is propelled off in some new and unknown direction. Perhaps the ancient mythical figure of Kairos, like the contemporary mythic figure of the Who's Tommy, knows that creativity is about becoming, the part, of, becoming part of the machine and learning how to play it. So with that, um, I'll stop uh, the formal talking at you business. And, um, and I just kind of wanted to put a question out there, and, and people can take it and, and run with it as they want to, or pose other questions, of course. Um, but I guess one of the things that I um, still try to think about, again, if, if my interest anyway, is about um, creating a robust public culture um, and how to go about doing that and how to sort of keep as many and interesting texts in circulation as possible. Um, if um, what I'm saying is true in that regard, then, then um, that, that, that circulation of text is central to culture, then what would it take for an open commons to really serve as an alternative to, that might actually enjoy a level of circulation that could actually compete with the kind of more hegemonic, corporate-owned um, culture? So in other words, how does something like Creative Commons or, um, or the sort of free culture movement more largely um, and the content that it produces translate, if, if, if you think it should at all, and maybe, maybe you don't, um, into the mainstream and not remain this kind of countercultural outlier um, that focuses, that, that's um, driven by and focuses on um, a group of people who are interested in specifically these issues. That is, is it, is it to remain kind of a cultural space where people debate issues of, um, of um, copyright and intellectual property and people who are concerned about those issues, should that remain the content of the thing? Or is there a way for it to kind of translate into people who ne don't necessarily have an interest in those issues at all, um, can see the value and take advantage of its resources and, and so on? Um, so with that, I think I'll just kind of put that out there and see what people think as well about anything else that people would like to discuss. <laughs> never afraid of no, never afraid. <laughs> I have, I have a, a uh, vocabulary point that, uh, uh, from my f field to yours and a, a question from your field to mine. I am in, in the law, induced intellectual property law, and one of the, the dis underlying distinctions of, of things like copyright is often the, the idea at any rate that there is some sort of separation between the idea and the expression of the idea, and that what is prevented from being used is the expression and not the idea. And in your talk, you repeatedly talk as though you use, you say, you know, copyright law constrains ideas, and, and you may be using ideas in a somewhat different way, but but at least in, in the very technical way that lawyers think about it, 
that's just not what it does. The, 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 the internal motion is that. So, so I, I don't know whether you're doing that intentionally or whether right. you just, just, just uh, are using ideas in a way that, that would not be w the way we would use it. And I would urge you to perhaps at least take that on board. Yeah, yeah. My, my, my question in return is, is and I'm just uh, unacquainted with, 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 with the field that you're describing, and, and, and uh, nice, to, nice to have my, my eyes open, what is a public? In, in this context, you talk about publics, as, right. as, and, and it's just not a term I've, I've got any experience with, so I would, would appreciate it if you'd illuminate. No, that's great. I mean, I think that the, the notion of I ideas is, I'm, I guess, I'm not trying to, to um, come down in any way about sort of what ideas are so much as look at the way that it gets, they get talked about. Or that, so I'm looking at the ways that um, activists will talk about um, um, that you know that property law is 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 sort of um, choking off the free flow of ideas, and I think that I think distinction is an important. That's one. that's actually not what it's doing. Right, right. Yeah, maybe. No, I think that's an important distinction that I think is is absolutely worth making. Um, the notion of what is a public is is something that's very much um, in debate, right? I mean, so so for people like um, Habermas, for example, who it coined the term public sphere and. Um, a sort of well-known um, German philosopher on this topic. Um, for him, it's it's precisely that space that's separate from private enterprise on the one hand and um, governments on the other. So, th so the public is that thing that keeps at bay. To have a thriving, robust public, you keep at bay both capitalism on the one side and the state on the other. Um, that's not a version of the public that I'm wanting to advance. Um, I think that... Um, that those, I mean, that you can't separate out publics from markets and publics from, um, you know, the citizenry and so, or the, the sort of the government and so on. So for me, um, publics um, are groups that kind of hover around centralizing texts, right? So they're, they're communities that hover around certain sets of ideas um, and so on. But I mean, that you know, these things are, these things are, Squirrely and debatable, for sure. <laughs> so, so can I um, see if I understand the question that you posed at the end? Yeah. Um, uh, is it, because it sounds to, uh, at, at times it sounded to me as though you were saying, well, can there be an alternative, sort of public alternative mode that is this sort of more creative commons mode, more uh, our space maybe mode? Um, but that, to me, sounded separate from what we have now, rather than sort of an ecosystem where perhaps the center of gravity has shifted um, from where it is now, which is the vast majority of all people outside this room um, are quite content with the status quo, or as far as they know, uh, and not in that the, the sort of the commons discussion tends to happen within an elite of some sort or other. Yeah. So was it was it a separate? Was it shifting within? Or would you rephrase it in a way that I didn't understand? <clears throat> I think what I'm, I'm, and again, I'm just kind of trying to think this through too, which is why I wanted to pose the question, is that um, <clears throat> is, there, is there a way for um, some of the values that, say, you know, free culture or a lot of the people in this room probably are, are committed to, if, it, are those sort of destined to be um, this kind of, you know, rabble rouser from the peanut gallery kind of thing, or or is there potential there for it to, to be a kind of major player in terms of cultural production? <clears throat> um, and, and that would involve people who don't necessarily care about issues of um, free expression and so on, but just see it as a, as a good means to an end um, for getting their work done or for getting their art done. So I'm just, yeah, that helps. Please. Um, I'm going to throw in an idea from, from the global health world, which is the area that I know something about. And I was talking about some of these issues with some journalists from uh, Uganda and, um, and uh, some public health people from also from Uganda and, um, and Tanzania and some other places in Africa. And they immediately got the importance of creative commons and of net neutrality, and of, of a number of different things. I mean, I, I hardly had to explain anything at all, because they saw that that chokehold on information could keep them 
backward and, and the, the, the least or the less powerful partner um, in, a, in a larger global context. And I wonder if, I mean, I think about some of the um, supposed values of global health, of open access to, to health care, of a lot of sharing and, and so forth. Is there some way to make a, an alliance there? Because I, the global health experts that I'm that I know have not yet cottoned on to creative commons. When they talk about making alliances with the business school to create case studies of what works and what doesn't, they don't think about whether or not those case studies are copyrighted or licensed under creative commons. They don't think about whether it's open software that's running their e-medical records, et cetera. So that's one possibility of, of it going beyond the the elites in, in this room or, or similar rooms. I, I was wondering, um, I have also a little bit of background in audience and public research kind of thing, um, that if you, if you think, were you specifically talking about um, or proposing this whole model for people that are the, the jammer, so to speak, or the more general public? Because I was thinking, if you think about process of inoculation and isn't it exactly if you would say that if publics become part of the machine and they have to learn how to play it although within a creative commons setting isn't it exactly that that could actually lift up the whole counterculture issue that that may be the start of that they start out with so the whole idea of their expression and creativity becomes part of the system, although it may be Creative Commons in the sense that it may be easier to express yourself. So I was wondering if, how, how, from your talk, I, I, um, I did not get how you actually see that yourself, what this actually means for these sorts of expressions, if it becomes part of the system. Right. I don't know if you can answer that, actually. I, I'm not, if, if I'm not understanding the question, then, then put me back on course, but I, I think that um, part of the problem with some of the more oppositional strategies that I look at that I didn't talk very much about now, but um, I think part of those problems is that they envision themselves as being outside, sort of throwing stones. Um, um, and I, I, I find that to be not only counterproductive to what they're trying to do, but not realistic as far as you know, where they find themselves. They constantly, so for example, adbusters constantly find themselves um, the subject of critiques um, by like-minded people who call them sellouts because they're now selling sneakers, you know, um, sweatshop-free sneakers and, and so on. I think it's, it's, that, it's that position, that avant-garde position of, of sort of being outside the machine that sets you up for all kinds of, um, um, for all kinds of frustrations. Um, not the least of which is the fact that advertising itself, the thing that so many of these activists are wanting to challenge, um, is all about telling you that you'll be an independent, avant-garde, sort of thinking outside the box person if you buy this or that extreme product. Um, so that so the kind of rebel outsider position is the most dominant trope used by advertisers. Um, so that so activists constantly positioning themselves there. Is, is in some ways in the face of contemporary, you know, contemporary commercial culture um, seems to be kind of playing right into the hands of, you know, of marketers. Um, I think that the thing that's interesting, one of the many things that's interesting about the kind of more creative commons approach is that it, it, it kind of, at least it has the potential, and this is I guess one of the things I'm interested in people's thoughts about, I um, mean, at least has the potential to kind of take the wind out of the sails of the big brand giants because it's, you know, it's not about saying no to Mickey Mouse or saying no to Barbie. It's like Barbie and Mickey Mouse is neither here nor there, right? It's just like about creating this pool um, that that isn't dependent either either in a negative or a positive way um, with, with corporate culture. Um, but it's not one that can be said to be wholly outside it either, right? And it's not one that I think ultimately, I mean, and it's my position that um, any kind of that avant-gardeism in general it doesn't serve, and I don't I don't put Creative Commons in this camp. Um, but avant-gardeism, like 
um, culture, like many culture jammers kind of position themselves as, um, is ultimately rhetorically as a social movement, as a model for social movements, a dead end. Um, because it so depends on a monolithic enemy that you're sort of, that you're constantly critiquing and so on. And I think that the thing that's compelling about Creative Commons is that it doesn't do that. Um, it's not about <coughs> throwing stones at, at a monolithic enemy. It's about creating alternatives that don't position themselves outside it, um, but, but don't wholly depend on this negative relationship to it either, um, at least in, in my estimation. So, I, so um, I think my goal is, or at least in the way I'm trying to think about it, is to do away with these kinds of inside-outside mainstream counterculture dichotomies anyway, because I don't think that they're really very um, descriptive of how things really work. Because we have culture jammers working in industry as advertisers, right? I mean, the, the, that magazine comes out of the design community, the graphic design community, and you know that we have, you know, Andy Warhol, you know, was it was making, you know, displays for stores, you know, that that, that whole movement mo came out of, you know, marketing and advertising. So I mean, these things are so inextricably linked that I think any rhetoric that tries to presume otherwise or to to, to to pull the two things apart and to, to look at them as some ter separate entities um, kind of misses opportunities. Would this also mean that, um, let's say, the, the, the creator online, just so not a critiquer, but let's say someone who does stuff on YouTube and miss, you know, do the mashups and stuff, uh -huh. would, would that kind of person also fit this kind of model, do you think? Or Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. The, that's the thing is that, um, you know, that's why, um, I find it compelling because it's not one that's dependent on um, the what rebel position, right? right? It's like, oh, I'm just an artist doing, you know, using this because it's most, it's the most, um, it makes the most sense for me to get my work out or to me, me to continue my work is to, to, you know, take advantage of the resources that are out there. Then to, not to say that it takes the politics out of it. There's always going to be people who yeah. are engaging at that at that level, and I think that that's important. Um, right, just as I think that the people who are fighting just for good old-fashioned fair use is, is important work mm -hmm. to be done. Um, but in addition to that, um, kind of, you know, more oppositional stuff that has to be done, um, creating this other pool um, that just sort of everyday people can take advantage of seems to me important. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not moderating. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so I think... It, it sounds to me as though some of this discussion, sort of tracks discussion that's been going on inside Creative Commons, sort of is it a movement or is it yeah. a, a, a tool that can be used by all sorts of movements? Right. Uh, is it just a set of licenses that can be taken by people who agree with one another or by people who disagree? Um, or does it collect all of the activist causes that uh, all of the, the license adopters are part of. Right. Um, and I think of late, it's been trying to uh, divide those pieces out into the core of Creative Commons, the house of licenses, and uh, iCommons, the meeting place of like-minded activists who use the licenses and then build out projects that go in uh, multiple directions. Right. And I think any social movement works that way, right? Whether you call it a movement or not, right? That there, that there's that kind of um, the pragmatic sort of um, the architecture of the thing that that um, and those people who are kind of fighting based on ideology or values and so on. But yeah, no, I think that that makes sense. Yeah, I was just gonna. Um, ask a question about the about this. Uh, you drew attention to um, to the lyrics that Pete Townsend wrote about being being part of the machine, and um, if I remember correctly, that's maybe halfway through the the CD or the opera, and maybe two thirds of the way through the through the movie. And then um, I not I don't want to pretend. I, I think we all know that it, that there's not an explicit policy document in you know in Tommy, but um, <laughs> but. But let, okay, well maybe there is, and I'm wrong again. I'm used to that. But um, uh, later on, Tommy is no longer uh, blind, deaf, and dumb, but um, can see, and there's a process that um, creates or miraculously generates that somehow. And um, among other lyrics, there's also the part where he and people working with him, who also may be followers, that's debatable, um, say we're not going to take it, and uh, we 
never did, we never will. Right. So there's something more oppositional, and at the same time, there's there's a. Um, uh, I think it's fair to say that since Tommy can see, he can now have a broader view of. Um, he, he can choose whether to be part of the machine or stand away from it and work with it as a as an agent, something like that. So anyway, um, does that mean anything with the uh, within the context of what you were talking about, or is that just my no, that's wacky really great, adolescent yeah. musings? Yeah. Um, I mean, I have to think about that more. I think that no, that's that's good. But I mean, part of what I was trying to get at there, and, and maybe the metaphor works or it doesn't work, and and. Um, now I'm sort of seeing the chinks in the armor of the, of the metaphor. No, no, but I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does it? What does that do to the? Yeah. Well, how I was trying to think about it, and I, I, when I just when I talk about this concept of kairos with my um, students, I'll often um, use the example of that it's it's the difference between, um, and I don't know if this works or not, but it works for me. But it's the difference between American football and soccer. Because right, American football is like a coach designs a play, the actors go out onto the field and they enact the play. So they, the, 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 the play exists a priori, the enactment of the, of the play. Um, whereas soccer is much more chirotic in that it's this like, a team um, you know, is having to respond in the moment to like where, you know, that it's, it's much less play oriented, that the play is much more spontaneous and chirotic and, and sort of you're responding to the particular conditions much more so. And I know it's not a perfect analogy, um, but that's what I was kind of trying to get at with that notion of um, pinball and sort of Tommy feeling, you know, sort of being part of it to, as an extension of himself and so on as a, um, as a better way of thinking of, um, of production than this kind of you know, I'm here and the content is there sort of thing. But yeah, I like your um, interpretation of it. Maybe a limitation on it. I should have to think about it. I just think, I feel like I'm still sort of digesting this whole uh, concept. I, I, I like the football soccer <coughs> <laughs> description. I think that's quite useful. I suspect that there are, I mean, as going back to the Big, the meta question that you asked, I suspect that there are lots of good answers and examples and foods for thought. And I guess my gut reaction, not feeling like I'm the best informed in this, is that um, there are already movements in, in the market afoot that are not value-based in the sense of right. what's the right way to do things or the wrong way to do things because it's you know some deeply held social um, idea, but rather that they're seeing a market opportunity and they're starting to realize, and this is maybe having drunk too much Kool-Aid, um, but I feel like there are lots of examples, whether it's in the space of innovation or anything you're seeing in um, uh, kind of the digital media kind of space, right. where people are starting, or where industry is starting to realize that the drag that certain aspects of intellectual property place on using exactly. and creating right. and stuff are is greater than the benefit that it gives. Now, I, don't, I mean, it's definitely slow in coming and look no further than the RAAA to say that it's not, you know, right. it's not pervasive uh, right. by any stretch, but I think there are lots of examples where you're starting to see it. And my suspicion is that you, you see Creative Commons fighting in its way and its community um, and making its points, but that the existing system is gonna move quickly to kind of co-opt uh, and to retain its mode of production. and. You know, and if it's smart, and maybe certain entities within it will be smart, uh, they'll recognize these new opportunities to create, to produce, and, and information, and ideas, and um, cultural products, and more. Um, and that it will retain this ecosystem. I was just talking to one of our faculty directors, John Dayton, the other day. He was talking about how when companies think about marketing now, and they, and they think about putting a video or something out into um, the world, it's not a question of whether they will uh, get ridiculed and get spooked. It's a question of how they'll get spooked yeah, yeah, yeah. and how can they get spooked in the right way as opposed to the wrong way. And it, so it's very much become part of how they see their, yeah. as you, as you know, yeah. they're turning over this aspect of the marketing and they're trying to direct it in a certain way so that it makes them look kind of fun and cool, right. if, albeit the butt of a joke, right. which I thought was terrifically interesting. No, that is that is really interesting. <clears throat> and I guess. About you know that certain corporations are sort of starting to. We were talking about this a little bit last night um, at the Free Culture um, Group meeting. That um, 
that certain companies are seeing that it just makes more sense to take that leap of faith and to, to, to kind of, um, you know, allow for broader collaboration to have a little bit of a less of a proprietary, you know, claim on, on their content and so on. And, and I mean, it seems like, again, people in the, this room are going to know much more about this than I do, but I mean, it seems like when it comes to code and source stuff, then, then, then companies seem to kind of get that it's in some ways more efficient to, um, to allow people to collaborate and so on. But I guess the question then becomes, what about when you're talking about content? It doesn't, it isn't valued based on efficiency, right? That you're not trying to solve problems with a film or a song in the same kind of way. I mean, you could argue that you are, but in the same kind of way as you are just with a piece of software. So um, where, it, where is the, um, you know, the incentive for more mainstream groups that don't necessarily care about um, the ideological, you know, it's more democratic or any of that, right? That that's not necessarily the interest. Um, how do you show that it is a good um, avenue? And I think, I guess that's part of my question, that content isn't driven by efficiency in the same kind of way. I was just uh, uh, intrigued by your, your notion that, uh, the fact that, that there is not necessarily an opposition between the more public um, a kind of uh, uh, space of, of operation and, and the traditional market uh, kind of space. As I, as I was thinking about it, uh, the opposition really comes when, when people try and move from maybe one domain to the other. Because although we all know little bits and pieces of exception, by and large most people operate within their, their kind of daily personal sphere as though copyright didn't exist. I mean, I certainly do. Uh, uh, you know, you just you know everybody operates with, with in that way, and you and you quote from books, and you send it to your friend, and you you know you you write fan uh, uh, magazine things, and uh, you know uh, takeoffs, and you post them on, on on small websites and all that. And we just operate, in fact, quite quite as though it's irrelevant. And every now and then, some thunderbolt comes out of Zeus, and and we we and you know strikes somebody dead. But but mostly, you know, people just don't don't pay attention. And it's really only when you move into either some kind of very public oppositional role or into that sphere yourself that, that, that suddenly the, the, the gods of copyright take notice of you and 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 then you have to have to, to deal with it so I, I you know I, I see this kind of kind of bubbling level of the informal publics if I can use that that term not too badly uh, where, where, where it, it, it's it's not it's not a question and then you get to the more formal levels or the more or the more commercially oriented it's only when you really either want to oppose or or, or be part of that, that that the commercial interests kind of come down on you. Is that too too too? Um, and it seems like I mean, and it seems like companies are increasingly you know trying to really choose their battles around a lot of this stuff because sometimes it behooves them to go after go after copyright infringers. Other times it doesn't, right? Other times it's just plain bad PR. I mean, I think Mattel found themselves in a lot of trouble in the '90s with going after fan sites and these kinds of things, right? That, um, I think that this obviously the smarter um, companies get that you you want people to have their fan sites. You don't want to be going after you know that sort of thing that um, that you can really um, hurt yourself in the long run um, by letting things come out in this kind of David and Goliath way. Um, and I think I mean I guess part of the question too is that um, one difference. I mean I don't want to suggest that there are no differences between markets and publics, whatever that means. I just want to suggest that they're not these separate entities either. Um, you know, one of the difference seems to be that, you know, the difference between, I guess, an artist and a content provider, you know, whatever that doesn't might be, is, is that one is, is usually in it for profit, right? That there's profit is sort of the goal, whereas for a lot of people, um, I think, who are wanting to take advantage of, um, you know, Creative Commons and other means is, um, you know, that the goal can be all kinds of things. It can be the, you know, reputation. It can be, you know, getting your, the, the pride of getting your work out there. It can be earning, you know, a certain, like, credibility among your community. It can be, you know, all, there's all kinds of things that drive, you know, I mean, pe people are driven to create all the time. Um, and so it's just, it's interesting to see if, I mean, I don't know if something gets lost as corporations just adopt, uh, you know, if they adopt kind of Creative Commons style um, licenses, um, if that does anything um, instrumentally to undermine the sort of profit-only model we seem to have um, in terms of cultural production, but I don't know. Any final words, thoughts, reflections? Well, in that case, please join me in thank you. Thank you. Thank you.